test. Oh my gosh, what an epic fail. So it looks like I didn't have the um, microphone in place. So what I'm going to do is go back to the first slide and start this over. I've only been in like five minutes in, so it's not like a big deal. So, okay, cool. So if anybody was here watching live, let me know in the Q&A, because obviously this is an epic fail. So I'm going to have to actually edit this, I think, uh, when I publish it live. So welcome to the Film Trooper Presents Film Marketing Fridays. I'm your host, Scott McMahon. I'm a fellow Film Trooper, and um, I will go ahead and say hi real quick. As this should switch over. Switch over. Okay, there we go. There I am. Yeah, so if anybody had watched that first part, um, I failed to actually activate the microphone. So, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> but if anybody's there live, go ahead and uh, throw in a, a question for me using the question, the Q&A app. Uh, today I want to kind of go over the big picture. So we have a um, of just business in terms of who's making the money and how do we figure out our film marketing strategies within that confines. And so let's just get on with the slide share part of it. So, or I don't know what they call, Google calls this thing, uh, presentation. Okay, there we go. So it's Film Trooper Presents, Film Marketing Fridays. And um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. So I want to talk about the gold rush. In, um, in the 1840s, um, I'm rough, I'm guessing right now, I don't have the exact date when the actual gold rush boom happened, but during the 18, mid-1800s, you know, a lot of people from around the world flocked to California in hopes and dreams of finding gold nuggets to become rich, you know, and that's what caused the boom of California. But the question is, who made all the money during the gold rush? Uh, a lot of you probably own, already know this uh, answer. But um, it wasn't the prospectors. It wasn't the people that did find gold. That didn't make them rich. The people that made all the money during this time were the business people who sold the tools to all these dreamers, all these prospectors. These are people who, like uh, Levi Jeans who sold the, the denim uh, clothing so that you can do your job as a prospector and try to find gold. These are the people who sold you the picks, the, the tents, and the shovels, anything that you needed to, um, to, to live out that dream of possibly finding the gold. But the people that made all the money were the people selling all the, all the tools. So what was the new gold rush? The new gold rush is like, who wants to be a star? You know, in Hollywood, Hollywood, everybody wants to be a star. Either you want to be an actor, actress, a rock star, a film composer, a director, a producer, anything, a cinematographer. You're, you're, you're living out this dream. And when I say Hollywood, it's, um, it's almost, like a, almost like more of like a metaphor, a mindset of where all these dreamers are coming to. And there's a lot of, a lot of that that's in centrally focused in the Los Angeles area. Um, but who is making all the money? Again, uh, if this is sort of a paraphrasing of Francis Ford Coppola's quote where he was saying, who is paying the creatives? If you know who is paying the creatives, and they are the ones with the power. And the ones, and there is a subset of this industry is how many people are selling the dream. When I say that, think to yourself about how many people are selling like, hey, learn how to write a screenplay, learn how to make a movie, learn how uh, to act, you know, on how to book that audition, how to, you know, make your first movie or whatever it is. It's information being sold to you. It's people are selling you the tools. I will teach you the tools or give you the tools. Uh, the big one is like camera gear. Um, again, talking to Jason Brubaker over at filmmakingstuff.com, he had a real good point is that that's why all these blogs are so popular about equipment. We love our gear, and it's like the potential, because all of our excitement is wrapped up in this potential, the potential of all this great stuff that if we can own it or have access to it, we can make something great. Um, but as soon as filmmakers sort of go down that path of making something, um, you know, I think Ted Hope threw out like a tweet that said, you know, 80% of filmmakers, first-time filmmakers, never make a second film. It's because the process is so arduous and so grueling 
um, that it sort of weeds out a lot of the people <laughs> to keep going to make more after that. And so we get kind of caught up in like all the potentials. So we are buying into this dream because the dream is we want to be a star, right? That's the whole point. So now the question is, what is the new, new gold rush? Well, in case you haven't noticed, I think everybody wants to have like a hoodie and be like the next Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, so the question is, who wants to be a startup king or queen? And queen, or, or queen, and queen, whatever. <laughs> so what is big business now? If the new gold rush, the new, new gold rush is being a startup um, entrepreneur, um, then what this is this industry the information industry uh, this is regarding like online business online marketing all this type of stuff is uh, big business right now because we are supplying the tools to all these hopefuls like myself dreaming of becoming a successful entrepreneur or a startup king and queen um, so the information industry the tools the digital tools the books the uh, classes the uh, training the coaching anything that goes into this is big business now because people have a dream, uh, an appetite to become uh, their own uh, boss, their own entrepreneur. Um, so that right now is the new, new gold rush. So how does the film industry, how does independent film fit into all this? Well, let's take a look at the extreme sports industry, sort of give it some context. Um, who makes all the money in the extreme sports industry? Well, in our who are the rock star athletes? So we see some athletes, you know, either Sean White with uh, snowboarding and skateboarding. Uh, there's motocross or surfing. There's skate, you know, again skateboarding. There's a lot of these really amazing, like extreme sports athletes, you know, living sort of the rock star dream, and that's what's being sold to us because and sold to kids because they want to be that rock star athlete. They want to be the next, you know, Sean White. Um, but the question is, um, are the expendable? Sorry, I should have rewrote that. Should say, are are they expendable? <laughs> I forgot the why. Anyhow, we're all expendable, and all these rock star athletes are expendable. Or even like, if you look at the, not even extreme sports. If you look at sports in general, you know, f the National Football League. If you get hurt, you're expendable. Doesn't matter how great of a rock star uh, athlete you were. So s stuff like that to think about. And the question is the companies that are selling the extreme sports or it's the sports industry, they're selling a lifestyle. So what lifestyle are they selling? And, uh, and then you have to ask your question, the question is what lifestyle is Hollywood selling? And that's sort of where we are in with in terms of the independent film world. So look at this. Yoo! Hurley is a huge um, extreme sports uh, branding company. Of course, they make you know products. They make... Um, you know, uh, clothing of all, t all all sorts. But when they put an ad out like this, this is essentially selling the dream. They're selling this dream lifestyle. And um, yes, they have a few uh, athletes that they sponsor and that do live the rock star lifestyle. And they, those are the people that are selling the dream to the rest of us. And then um, let's look at another dream. Oh, how they adore you. Look at you know, Brangelina. At the red carpet at Cannes or wherever they're at, but look at this adoration or you know clamoring. So th these are the images that we get bombarded with because they're in our subconscious. They're they're sort of what drives our um, irrational emotional aspect to to live out this dream. Um, but the people making all the money are the people behind all of this stuff that are um, selling you know selling you the dream either to tools or or you know or through their branding lifestyle all that kind of stuff. So the bottom line is you are expendable. We are all expendable as creatives. And my thing is I think your film has to be an advertisement. In order to survive or become sort of the entrepreneur, um, you know, your film is going to have to be an advertisement. And I'll explain that in a little bit more. And you have to sell a dream. And that's what you're advertising. Your film is an advertisement for selling some sort of dream. And what is that dream? Well, I'll show you some examples. Um, this is, and let's see here. And what can you, wait, yeah, that's right. What can your film sell? So I'm going to switch back to um, me real quick again. 
So that was really quick. I mean, it was maybe like a 15-minute presentation. But I hope you kind of get the big picture of, like, who's controlling all the strings? You know, who's controlling all the money? And sort of where we as creatives or independent filmmakers sort of fill, fit into this whole scheme of things. So you're not, like, blindsided by your own um, ego or dreams that, that get you... Um, you know, this disillusion that maybe it's not quite working out. Uh, just know that um, there are people out there that are supplying great tools for filmmakers, uh, but they filmmakers, a lot of filmmakers, to use their tools in order to make money for themselves or make money for the company. And so by supplying tools like that, they are um, selling the, the dream and making all the money. So let me see here real quick. Okay. So I wanted to... Um, show you what I meant by someone who's sort of maybe working outside of the Hollywood um, system to kind of give you an idea of how you can make money, how you can sell the dream, how you can sell and uh, use your film as an advertisement um, to make some, you know, basically make bigger money. So let's take a look at this. Um, okay, I'm going to do this. Sorry, I got it. Screen shares. Oh, wait. What is this? That's what I want. Okay. Okay, so you can see this film, I don't know if anybody heard it before. It was called, it's a documentary by Joe Cross. He's an Australian uh, businessman, entrepreneur, and it was called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And in this film, he was weighing almost 400 pounds. And, you know, and so he went on this 60-day uh, juicer uh, fast diet where that's all he ate and drank. That's it. It was basically just raw vegetables and fruit uh, thrown through this um, juicer. And then for 60 days, he lost like 200 something pounds and looks amazing. And then he got another, he was, so he took this road trip for like across uh, the United States and he, he ended up in uh, places like uh, Iowa and New Orleans and so on. And he met um, a truck driver that was, you know, weighed over way plus 400 pound plus and helped him uh, reduce so much weight using this um, this fasting diet um, system using juicers well the film was so uh, moving and so inspiring because he was selling the dream of getting healthy and losing weight that if you you know you go to his site for his film fat sick <laughs> fat sick fat sick and nearly dead one of the first things he does is right up front is the whole movie makes you want to go, geez, I've got to get myself a juicer. So if you click this, it goes to Amazon. But what you don't know is like this code up here is actually an affiliate link, meaning that Joe um, makes a hefty um, commission cut of every uh, juicer that is sold. And um, sometimes affiliate cuts are like 50%. So if like say this juicer, you know, it's running from $100, $200, $300 juicer. Um, if these things are, are selling or, you know, at $300, he's making about $150 a, um, a machine, uh, a juicer. So not that Joe necessarily needed the money. It, he was, like I said, he was already a successful businessman, entrepreneur. So he had already that mindset, and he probably already knew how to make this work. So... He made a lot of money selling juicers um, because I've heard a lot of people that had, had seen this movie and went right away bought a juicer. So this is the concept is that, hey, make a film, use it, use it as an adver advertisement. You're advertising a lifestyle, a dream of something or a solution uh, done in a very creative way and just apply some basic entrepreneurial business um, strategies, which is basically throwing up, uh, throwing up, <laughs> sounds gross, actually putting in place a product that you can sell as an, a, basically an affiliate, a salesperson, that you get a commission. So if I decided to buy any one of these uh, products, um, I'm going to, knowing that um, I pay the normal price anyway, even if I went to Amazon and searched my own, um, I would still pay like the $300 or the $100. But if I know that I'm helping um, uh, Joe out because his film moved me, I know that by clicking this link, 
I'm going to get, um, you know, he's going to get about, you know, 50% of the commission. So Amazon doesn't, Amazon doesn't take it all. So that's just something to think about. This is a strategy. And obviously you look over here, they've got an app out, an iPhone app out of like how to properly measure, um, you know, your juice items and, and so on. So he's created a whole movement. And the film was not only an advertisement for a product, but it was an advertisement for further discussion. Now again, this probably works better with documentaries, but if you get creative enough, you could possibly do it with um, genre films as well. So let's see here. If we go to um, another woman who's like crazy, sexy, cancer. Let's see here. Uh, Chris Carr, crazy, crazy products. Okay. So this woman at a young age was diagnosed with cancer, but then she beat it, and um, she started this whole um, whole brand based off this documentary that was made about her. So this is called Crazy Sexy Cancer. So again, this is a documentary, but the film, even though she's probably made some good money selling just the film itself, you can see that she's built, um, yeah, it doesn't help. I mean, it doesn't hurt, I'm sorry, to get uh, Oprah's Breast Blessing or Katie Couric or uh, Dr. Oz to be, you know, in your corner. But essentially people go and they, you know, she did her job of advertising, connecting with some really key influencers. I mean, Oprah's sort of the top of the game. Um, so people bought, you know, her DVD, um, the movie. But through here, there's all this other stuff that she sells based on the concept that's surrounded the movie. You know, she's got her wellness shop. Now she's got a book. Look at this. You know, Crazy Sexy Kitchen. She's branded it. So it's not just Crazy Sexy Cancer was the name of the movie. Now look at this. She's got a book, Crazy Sexy Kitchen. Crazy Sexy Juices, Crazy Sexy Diet, uh, Crazy Sexy Cancer Tips. You know, all the, look at this is amazing. Just you scroll down her site. So she's created an empire, a complete business around um, her experience and, and through her. Um, so you can see that she's been able to exploit her um, license and exploit the, um, the brand that she's created from these movies. And obviously that's something that um, needs to be um, thought into because you can't just have like a one-off uh, independent film and then just, you know, hope that... Um, yeah, a distribution company will take care of you. Right now, the distribution companies are hurting, and they're not doing anything to help you market your film. And so there's, you have to think of it as your film as the marketing device. It has to be seen as, um, you know, an advertisement for something bigger. So I'm going to switch over back to my, my mug, um, although it's not as attractive as Chris Carr's mug, but let's see here. There we go. Um, we're at 25 minute mark. We're probably going to cut this one short, about a half hour. Um, but those are things to think about in terms of marketing strategies. Um, you know, it's your film pretty much is the mar um, the advertisement, and it's, again, just gotta figure out like how you know, in a creative sense, how you can take your film product and use it to advertise something bigger because an entrepreneur was, would see it like okay great let's we're gonna add this film we're gonna make some money off it a little bit but it's really just going to be a launching point a communication um, method of selling something bigger and that's the question you have to ask yourself I mean are you selling a product are you selling something a solution are you selling the dream a lifestyle again if you look at like Hurley um, or any of the extreme sports products or, or Nike if you want to get into like sports stuff um, you know Under Armour all that stuff is this is apparel but they build all these advertisements or these commercials or these uh, photographs to sell this lifestyle this dream lifestyle and you kinda have to figure out uh, where you and your project kinda fits into that same paradigm I show you two examples from Joe Cross with fat sick and nearly dead where he was able to uh, compel people to buy a juicer and he just used an affiliate sales process to make even more money than this film probably ever made. Uh, Crazy Sexy Cancer um, was a compelling, a really inspiring, compelling story, but it was wrapped up in a documentary that then spurred all this other branding, this bigger uh, conversation, this bigger um, uh, company from it. 
So those are things that um, to think about going into your your next film project because you know you just want to know that you're um, that you're sort of just an expendable creative person that if you allow yourself to be part of that machine um, of all those um, people that control the money and the sort of the advertisement or the selling of those uh, that lifestyle that dream. Uh, just know where you fit into that place. I mean, you may be, get lucky, and you may be one of the rock stars that they, uh, you know, hoist up, and you can um, be shown to the world as an example. Um, but those uh, that percentage is very, very small. So trying to be more realistic in your uh, business approach as an independent, which you can do now with the um, with the with the internet and online marketing. Um, so that's sort of the thought today for Film Marketing Friday. No, it wasn't exactly marketing per se, but hopefully the one takeaway you can get from this session is simply maybe your film product is nothing more than an advertisement. And then you have to ask yourself that question, well, what am I advertising? What, am I, what does my film help sell? And that's really the big question. Um, as I wrap up here, I'm going to remind you again to oops that hey you know what I like always you know don't go away empty-handed you know this is a little ad I put together which is you know what equipment did I use to make a feature film for five hundred dollars with no crew just go to freegearguide.com and you'll get yourself an equipment list of everything I use to make this micro budget film um, and then when you get this free gear guide, you'll also be signed up for the Film Trooper newsletter emails um, where I'll send out some valuable emails to you to further the discussion about everything that we're talking here at Film Marketing Fridays. Again, just head over to freegearguide.com and uh, yeah, get this funny little fun guide of just a bunch of equipment. So you can kind of check off like, well, yeah, I have, I've got this gear, I've got this gear. Oh, I don't need, maybe I could use this gear, something like that. Anyhow. Um, let me go back to me. I just want to say uh, thank you, and I'm trying to. Oops, here, I gotta set this up. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody was here live. It's kind of off, like an off time. I actually have to get going. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a uh, cast in an audit, um, a commercial. Um, I will be uh, selling um, kids head lice preventative solution. <laughs> I play like a softball coach, so they showing like you know you don't want your kids to share helmets because uh, that's a could be an, um, a method or a way that kids could spread lice. So that's what I'll be doing today. So I got to get jamming to that um, commercial shoot right now. Anyhow, enjoy your Memorial Day weekend, and I hope that some of you get a chance to review this uh, episode. I know. It didn't work out live for the first part of it, and I, I don't think there's many people that were part of the live session uh, to be part of the Q&A. But I'll just keep going, and uh, I would love to have filmmakers actually on air with me, uh, like we did the first episode with Bullion, um, so I can have more discussions about your uh, particular projects, and we can get more specific questions answered. Or you know, again, I don't have all the answers, but I can. What I can do is like if you have questions. It gives me an active, um, um, I guess, an actionable item to do, which is to help find a solution or an answer to your question. And uh, that's what we're trying to do here at uh, Film Trooper, is just help other filmmakers make that bridge into entrepreneurship. And part of that process is understanding marketing, a big part of that, because that's sort of our last barrier as independent filmmakers, is um, film marketing. So en um, enjoy this episode. Thanks for um, those who tuned in, and I will see you at the uh, next filmmaking, film marketing Friday. Sorry, I have to do all this stuff at the same time, and I'm a little slow at it. Okay, thanks everybody.